Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Caesar in Britain by Historia Civilis. So, in recent Historia Civilis videos, we've been seeing Caesar's conquests in Gaul, along with the late Roman Republican politics. In the last video in particular, we saw Pompey's rise to influence. He sort of left the triumvirate behind uh, and rose to influence and prominence as uh, an individual. Uh, and it was sort of his year. And now, we're getting back to Caesar and his conquests. Uh, we're getting to Caesar and Britain. This is particularly interesting because Britain would become one of the corners, the edges of the Roman Empire. Uh, and to be fair, it's pretty far from Rome. Uh, it's also on a separate island. So uh, it's a pretty interesting conquest to cover. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and has exclusive Historia Civilis reactions. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. In 55 BCE, the situation in Gaul had been stabilized, but Caesar had even higher ambitions. He was going to invade Britain. Yeah, this definitely gives us a look at Caesar's level of ambition. Sure, Gaul has been stabilized, but it's still rather hostile territory. Um, and, you know, there's sort of potential for revolt or revolution to spring up at any time. Um, Gaul has been subdued to a certain extent, but it's not yet Roman territory. They don't dominate it to that extent, though, you know, they're getting there. Um, and with that situation, Caesar is still willing to embark upon another conquest on a, you know, separate island that he's probably pretty unfamiliar with. I'm not sure how much information the Romans knew about Britain, um, but I would assume probably not that much. The Romans knew virtually nothing about the island. Well, there you go. It was on the edge of the known world, with one foot in the realm of myth. Mm. People disagreed over whether it was an island at all, or instead a massive unexplored continent lying just off the Gallic coast. And that may sound a little silly to hear today, but to be fair, if you look at some early European maps of the New World, uh, you know, North and South America, they were also extremely far off. So, it, it, it does make sense that there would be some questions about what exactly Britain was. Um, I mean, of course, we have two islands. Uh, we've got Britain and Ireland, the British Isles. Um, and, you know, it, it may not be an unfair assumption at the time that perhaps there's more land. Perhaps it's a whole new continent, not just a small island. Some said that it was full of riches, with gold and silver lying openly on the ground, and Ooh. pearls on the beaches. There were stories about- uh, Once again, that that is somewhat reminiscent of what uh, the Europeans would one day say about the New World. Um, now, some areas of the New World did have a lot of gold and silver, but for example, the English would go looking for, uh, you know, gold in Virginia. There were tales of, you know, the plentiful gold they would find. Uh, they ended up not finding that much, if any. So, uh, another sort of similarity there. About the souls of the dead being ferried across the channel, which led some to believe that the island itself was entirely fictional. Whoa. But Caesar knew better. The Gauls conducted regular trade with Britain, and Caesar met with people who claimed to have been there. This is why Caesar had been so keen to eliminate the last shred of resistance in Gaul last year. Mm. It's also why he went out of his way to build a permanent base around modern Calais. Okay. This is where he planned to make his crossing. Everything was ready, but there were new developments. To his knowledge of the island, or at least some knowledge, is evident from the fact that he built a base at his water what is modern-day Calais, you know, one of the um, most popular crossings across the English Channel, and uh, I believe the shortest crossing, so clearly he, he knew that to build a base there. Two massive German tribes, over 400,000 people, began oh my to God. cross the Rhine that winter. 
Uh oh. This is exactly the kind of thing that Caesar wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. As soon as the snows began to melt, Caesar assembled his legions. Before long, he was marching to meet the German threat. His goal was to stop this before it spiraled out of control. And, you know, we talk about how they didn't know much about Britain. Britain was somewhat mythical in the eyes of the Romans. They also didn't know too much about, you know, the tribes past the Rhine, the German tribes. Um, they obviously knew they existed, and they, they knew some things about them, but that was also an area that the Romans were largely unfamiliar with. Um, and so they would sometimes be surprised by events like this, or would only find out about these mass migrations you know, when it started getting close to Roman territory, or, you know, passing over the Rhine River. When he got close, the Germans sent a diplomat. The diplomat told Caesar that the Germans had been forced from their homes by a much larger German tribe, and if the Romans could find them a place to resettle, they would commit themselves to being strong and loyal allies to the Roman people. This story didn't move Caesar at all. <laughs> he wasn't interested in new German allies. He was interested in his expedition to Britain. Uh. He told the diplomat that Gaul was already filled to capacity, which wasn't really true. But, he said, there was a tribe on the German side of the Rhine that kept on asking for Roman assistance against invaders. If they marched to that tribe's aid instead, they would probably be allowed to settle in their territory when the whole thing was over. This was a pretty clever way to kill two birds with one stone, yeah. keep the Romans out of it, and stabilize the German side of the Rhine in the process. The diplomat took Caesar's offer back to the Germans. This was a giant decision, and they debated the issue over several days. I will say just the fact that this was the proposal presented shows you the position the Romans were in. They were clearly, even at this point, the dominant power in the region, uh, in Gaul. And they were able to facilitate... I don't know if this deal is going to go through, but the fact that it was suggested in the first place shows that, shows that the Romans are able to facilitate deals like this. You know, they are the power broker, the negotiator, the arbitrator. They are the dominant power that smaller powers come to <coughs> to work things out. While the Germans debated, Caesar took this opportunity to close the distance between them and his army. Uh-oh. That's not threatening. <laughs> After a few days, the German diplomat returned, saying that they would agree to Caesar's plan as long as they could get the tribe on the other side of the Rhine to swear an oath guaranteeing their safety. Okay. They would need a few more days to get in touch with them. So a few more days passed, and Caesar continued to close the distance. Oh no. And then something happened. According to Caesar, 800 mounted Germans ambushed Caesar's men while they were out foraging for supplies, killing a small number of them before running away. Personally, I have doubts that the Germans attacked first, but regardless, Caesar claimed that this only confirmed his worst suspicions. Yeah, I also have serious doubts, and keep in mind that uh, most, if not all, of our sources of, you know, Caesar's conquests in Gaul uh, are from Caesar himself. A lot of our information of what happened in his campaigns come from his writings. So obviously, everything is extremely biased, and we have to look at it through that lens. Um, I think I've said this about Caesar before, but Caesar knew what he wanted, and any excuse to take what he wanted, he would take. So it doesn't matter if, you know, the German tribe attacked first or not, I seriously doubt they did. If Caesar wanted to attack them, he would find an excuse. And Caesar would always make up an excuse to make it look like, you know, he was defending himself, uh, even though, more often than not, he was the aggressor. Um, but, you know, basically, if Caesar wanted to attack this tribe and clear him out of there, he was going to do it regardless and that the Germans were only playing for time as reinforcements flooded across the Rhine. The next morning, Caesar prepared for battle. A large German delegation, including all of the tribal leadership, arrived at the Roman camp, formally apologizing for the sudden outbreak of violence. Caesar ignored their apologies and arrested them on the spot. Exactly what I just said. If Caesar wants to attack this tribe, he's going to do it. Clearly, they don't want conflict. They probably didn't attack in the first place 
Maybe there was some sort of skirmish. Maybe a Roman foraging band attacked them. We don't know. But, you know, they've come seeking peace and negotiations, and Caesar's not interested. Caesar gets what he wants, um, regardless of, you know, any moral moral implications. <laughs> Let's take a step back for a minute. Caesar crossed the line here. Remember uh -huh. why he went to war against the Veneti last year? Rome sent diplomats, the Veneti arrested them, and Caesar responded by going to war. This is exactly the same thing in reverse. The hypocrisy wasn't lost on anybody. When word of this got back to Rome, Cato denounced Caesar for violating a truce and committing a sacrilege. <laughs> Cato suggested, half-jokingly, that the Senate should turn Caesar over to the Germans in order to <laughs> absolve the city of sin. Oh, Nobody man. took him seriously. Back to Caesar. With the German leap... I mean, I'm glad that he got at least a little pushback, but, you know, once again, Caesar's not operating based on principle, you know? That's not what he's doing. He's getting what he wants, and he's doing whatever it takes to get what he wants. Leadership in custody, Caesar marched on the tribes and launched a full-out attack. The Germans were leaderless, and nobody was able to coordinate a meaningful defense in time. It quickly turned into a one-sided slaughter. This is probably more evidence that they didn't initiate some sort of secret planned attack because they were not at all ready for the Roman assault. So... But, you know, we kind of already knew that they probably didn't actually do that. This is just sort of further evidence. <clears throat> Many Germans escaped, but were pursued by the cavalry all the way back to the Rhine. Some even tried to swim back to German territory, but were told that they all drowned. Jesus. The Romans would later try to spin this as a great military victory, but let's be honest, it wasn't. It was Caesar needlessly slaughtering at least tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who yeah. were only interested in Rome's protection. But Caesar wasn't done. His fear was that persistent instability on the Rhine would jeopardize his expedition to Britain. Jesus. He decided to take his army across the Rhine to punish the Germans, which he hoped would prevent any further incidents from derailing his plans. Some friendly Germans volunteered to ferry his men across the river, but in a classic display of that famous Roman arrogance, he calls this beneath the dignity of the Roman <laughs> people. Caesar had his men begin to construct a massive bridge across the Rhine. Caesar describes the process of building this bridge in excruciating detail. <laughs> I read his account, and it almost killed me. Yeah, well, th that is very Roman of him. You know, they were very much into their engineering and building, and they were very good at it. So, uh, you know, how Roman of him to spend an inordinate amount of time describing the construction of this bridge that wasn't that important in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> All you need to know is that the Romans got it done in 10 days, and people who care about this kind of thing think it was some sort of technical achievement or something. Wow. Anyway, Caesar placed a strong garrison at both ends of the bridge to protect it from attack. Then he marched off into German territory. But there was nobody there. All of the villages were abandoned. The tribes had been alerted as soon as Caesar began building the bridge and had fled into the woods. Yep. Caesar then marched all over the place, burning down every abandoned village he could find. Nobody would come forward to fight him. Of course. Um, and, you know, this whole escapade is not one of Caesar's best moments. And stuff like this has made Caesar controversial throughout the years into the modern era. I mean, he's controversial also for his role in the downfall of Roman democracy. Um, but also he's controversial for his role as a conqueror, uh, slaughterer of innocents, etc., etc. Um, and, uh, you know... Many people have called this out throughout the years. He was, uh, you know, a figure of some discussion in the Enlightenment, for example, those who praised him and those who denounced him. Um, but, you know, stuff like this is what uh, makes his legacy more mixed. But, you know, he's a very interesting guy. He did a lot of stuff throughout his career. Um, all of it very fascinating. Um, you know, and, you know, some stuff more morally dubious than others, but, you know, like I said, Caesar gets what he wants.
After 18 days of this, Caesar just declared victory, claiming that he had successfully scared the Germans away. But <laughs> that wasn't really true. He didn't know this at the time, or maybe he did and he chose not to share it, but there was an army further into German territory ready to fight the Roman invasion. But the invasion never came. Caesar turned his army around and marched back across the Rhine. That is a very Roman thing to do. Get in there, burn some villages, uh, maybe kill some innocent people if you find them, and then declare you've won the war. We did it, guys. We've succeeded. We're the victors. You know, very Roman. <laughs> he then destroyed the bridge to prevent the Germans from using it in the future. <laughs> Caesar had now wasted more than a month on the Rhine when he Jeez. was supposed to be in Britain. The whole thing was a giant waste of time, and yeah. if we're being honest, it didn't accomplish anything. Well, it does give Caesar the distinction of being the first Roman general to lead an army across the Rhine. That's significant, and honestly, that little piece of propaganda may have been the point of the whole thing. I'm sure he had that in mind. But now, Caesar was finally free to lead his expedition to Britain. He ordered his leftover ships from last year to move up to modern Calais and marched his army up to the permanent base that he had conveniently built there. Mm. At this point, Caesar makes this radical claim that the people in Britain were sending supplies to his enemies in Gaul. This is almost definitely not true. <laughs> See, the Romans had this funny attitude toward war. They always liked to frame their wars as defensive, even when they weren't. It's that Roman legalism, it makes you do funny things. Yep. Yep. Anyway, I kind of hinted at this earlier saying that, you know, uh, if Caesar wanted to find a justification, he would find one, and he always would find one. Um, and Historia Civilis is touching on that as well. Um, the Romans had a very legalistic attitude towards everything, including warfare. Um, it's interesting, we sort of, I think, see some of that in the modern era where we all try to morally justify, uh, we all, I mean... The countries of the world usually try to morally justify the wars they engage in. You can't just have a simple uh, war of conquest anymore, unless you're Russia, of course. Um, you know, you have to justify the war you're waging on some sort of moral basis. We're doing this to liberate the people, to save people, to do this, to do that, to bring democracy. You know, there's this moral justification, and, and the Romans had something similar um, perhaps less based on morals, but more based on their legalism. You know, any war we wage must be justified in some way. Um, and they usually did that by making it appear defensive, even though, as we've seen, the Romans were often the aggressors in these situations. Anyway, once the legions and ships and weak justifications <laughs> were in place, Caesar was ready to launch his expedition. He only had enough transports to carry two of his eight legions, but that was enough. All right. He loaded his two legions onto the ships and left the remaining six in Labinus's capable hands. The transports pushed off in the middle of the night so that they would arrive off the coast of Britain by mid-morning. But the Romans were terrible sailors, and the <laughs> weather in the North Atlantic was a lot more unpredictable than they were used to. Yeah. Early in the morning, a storm whipped up, and a bunch of the ships lagging behind were forced to turn back. Unfortunately, these happened to be the ships carrying all of Caesar's cavalry. Uh-oh. The rest of the fleet continued toward the island. Yeah, we are now seeing the effects of something that even the Romans couldn't have prepared for, uh, which is Britain's famously bad weather. Uh, <laughs> I mean, legitimately, though, uh, Britain's weather has been a detriment to many military expeditions that have tried to conquer it. Uh, in one way or another, uh, and Caesar is running into that uh, terrible weather uh, and the, the rocky waters of the North Atlantic here. And after the sun rose, the men on the ships saw this. Mm. The White Cliffs of Dover, a wall of chalk in places over 100 meters high, spanning four kilometers in each direction. This was literally the worst place on the entire island to attempt to make a landing. <laughs> As the ships got closer... Also, not to mention, you know, that's got to be a pretty imposing sight. Um, I mean, it, sure, it is a natural formation, but that's got to be quite the sight to see when you arrive in Britain. You're already faced with what may seem like an insurmountable obstacle because... I mean, if you're one of these uh, random infantrymen on one of these ships and you see that, 
well, uh, you don't know how far these walls go. Frankly, you don't even know what the shape of the island is. Um, you know, will you ever find a way around these walls? Is there a passage? How do you get through? Uh, I'm sure some of those thoughts would be racing through your mind as you approached this impressive site. They could see people lining the cliffs. Oh, Native wow. Britons with their bodies covered in blue war paint, ready for battle. <laughs> Those on foot wielded swords and spears with shields, but many were on horseback, and some stood on chariots. It must have been quite a sight. That's also quite Caesar the welcome. brought his ships to a stop. Obviously, he couldn't land here, so he had to figure out what to do next. After consulting with his subordinates, Caesar decided on a course of action. The fleet waited until the late afternoon for stragglers to catch up, at which point they headed up the coast to the northeast, searching mm. for a suitable place to land. As they moved, the Britons on the shore shadowed them <laughs> along the cliffs. <laughs> oh no. Let's take a moment here and talk about how British chariots worked. Oh, okay. One person drove the chariot while other riders threw javelins or other projectiles. The horses were very fast and were trained to turn on a dime, which allowed them to zigzag erratically or charge full speed at the enemy line, only to turn at the last second. All the while, the riders threw their javelins. When they ran out of projectiles, the driver would get down off the chariot with their sword or spear and shield and fight on foot. While they fought, the chariot riders made sure that they were parked just behind the line of battle, ready to leave at a moment's notice. If the fighting turned ugly, all they had to do was take a few steps back, and they would be galloping away within a few seconds. Caesar goes on at length about how effective- I mean, it's a very versatile strategy. It allows for a lot of maneuverability and versatility in how each unit is going to behave. Um, also, a lot of speed. Uh, you know, you're taking some elements of cavalry and some elements of infantry and basically combining them. Now, there are surely downsides, but there are a lot of positives. If this tactic was. Anyway, for the rest of the afternoon, the Roman ships moved northeast, searching for a... I do wonder, I, I remember Histori Civilis talked about chariot warfare in his video on the Bronze Age Collapse, and chariots were really big at that time in history. Um, uh, it seems like chariots made up an important part of the British forces here. Uh, I do wonder if that was, and perhaps some of you have some insight on this, if that was unique to the island, or if there was chariot warfare throughout Europe. Was that prominent with other European tribes, or was it uh, mainly contained to Britain? And if so, uh, why? Replace the land. After many kilometers, the cliffs began to drop away, and they came across a suitable beach, but the Britons were still shadowing the ships. The infantry was having a hard time keeping up, but the cavalry and the chariots were doing just fine. When the Roman ships stopped, the Britons set up down on the beach, and mm. every minute, more Britons caught up, joining contested their Contested landing. This would be a contested landing. Yep. <laughs> the soldiers on their ships were not thrilled by this. Amphibious assaults were not really in their wheelhouse. The order was given to disembark, but nobody moved. Ooh. After a tense moment, a man bearing an eagle standard came forward, and according to Caesar, he shouted, Leap, fellow soul. Before we get to uh, this man's quote, th that's pretty notable because, you know, the Roman legions are famed for their discipline. Um, you know, under times of stress, uh, they were able to form up quickly and hold their ground. Um, you know, Roman soldiers would almost never shy away from a fight. So this has got to be one of the few instances I've heard of where, you know, they hesitated. I, I presume they're going to get off the boats uh, and, and make the landing. Um, but, you know, initially they clearly did not want to, um, which is, I think, a rare uh, lapse in discipline. And, and that perhaps shows you the mindset they were in. You know, this was probably a pretty intimidating welcome to the island. Um, you know, with the cliffs and the Britons tailing them. So yeah, that that's definitely notable, uh, I think at least. Soldiers, unless you wish to betray your eagle to the enemy, I, for my part, will perform my duty to the Republic and to my general. And with that, 
he jumped into the water, all by himself. Alright, respect. This shamed his fellow soldiers, and within moments, everybody was jumping in after him. As they moved toward the shore, the Romans were subject to intense missile fire, and when they got into shallow water, the British cavalry charged. But the Romans held their ground, and the mm. fighting continued. Caesar stayed aboard his ship and watched as the battle played out. Whenever spots in the line started to look like they were close to collapse, he sent a rowboat full of infantry as reinforcements. <laughs> the fighting was rough, but the Romans absorbed the worst of it when they met the initial cavalry charge. As time went on, the Romans gained sturdier footing, and eventually a signal was given and the Britons withdrew. Remember, the Britons were mostly cavalry and chariots, while the Romans were all infantry. The Britons easily disengaged without much fuss. Yeah, the Romans would always struggle against uh, cavalry forces or, uh, you know, in the future, for example, nomadic forces who had grown up riding horses. Um, and this is an example of that. Of course, I'm counting the chariots among that group because the Roman infantry were, I mean, sturdy and could hold the line, but weren't particularly fast. Whereas, you know, these British cavalry and charioteers, well, one of the benefits is that you can, you know, just zoom away when you're done. You can get out of there quickly, uh, and the Romans are not going to be able to catch you. That's just part of the maneuverability and versatility that uh, comes with that style of combat. We don't get an exact casualty count from this engagement, but we get the impression that the Romans paid a heavy price. Mm. I'm it sure. Was starting to get. I mean, a contested landing. The Romans are not used to that. They're not used to any sort of uh, combat involving uh, seafaring. Um, I'm sure it was hard fought as they tried to land, and uh, the Britons tried to stop them. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they took fairly heavy losses. Get dark. So the Romans got to work. Caesar and the rest of the men came ashore, and the <clears throat> transport ships were pulled up onto the beach. Mm. Caesar moved some of his men onto solid ground, where they built their fortified encampment. They spent the night safely behind walls. <laughs> As the sun rose the next day, the gravity of their situation started to set in. Caesar's cavalry hadn't made it, which meant that the Romans were literally in uncharted territory with virtually no ability to scout ahead. Right. But almost immediately, things began to improve. Diplomats from a nearby tribe. Also, before we get to that, I will say, you know, we talk a lot about maintaining supply lines in warfare. And, you know, it's been hard enough to maintain supply lines in Gaul, in hostile territory. You know, now you're over the English Channel. You know, you've got water separating you from Gaul. And then Gaul is not even really your home base. It's still partially hostile. So you've got to be pretty worried about um, how you're going to get supplies, particularly considering the Romans are bad sailors and they have to deal with bad weather in order to sail over the English Channel. So uh, that would definitely be a concern for me is uh, maintaining effective supply lines. They showed up, claiming that they weren't part of the army that had resisted the Roman landing. Sure. The diplomats came offering peace and surrendered hostages to the Romans as a sign of good faith. It seems unlikely that this tribe had nothing to do with the battle that just took place in their right. backyard, but Caesar wasn't really in a position to argue, so for, he accepted their peace offering. Yeah, for once. The weather was still pretty awful, so with peace established, Caesar let his men rest for a couple of days while the supplies were brought down off the ships. All right. Back in Gaul, they were also keeping a close eye on the weather. There were still a bunch of ships full of cavalry eager to make the crossing. Mm. They decided to try again. This time, they were able to successfully navigate the storm. They found Caesar's camp and prepared to come ashore. But suddenly, the weather turned again and the fleet was pushed out to sea. Oh, come Their on. Their ships were simply not built for weather like this. Oh. The fleet was scattered for a second time, and many of the ships were badly damaged. They barely made it back to the Gallic coast. That's got to be frustrating. To third crossing. Yeah, okay. This was some pretty bad luck, and it was about to get a lot worse. The Romans discovered that the ships on the beach had been knocked around <laughs> during the storm, and oh, some no. of them were so badly damaged that they were no longer seaworthy. 
Caesar oh. and his two legions were now stuck on the island. The Romans had no sc I mean, it seems to be getting worse and worse. And, I mean, at this point, that's got to be kind of a scary situation. Your other men cannot manage to get over to the island due to either bad weather or, you know, bad seafaring or badly made vessels. Uh, you are now basically trapped on the island until you can repair your vessels, if you can repair them. Um, you can't get supplies over from Gaul, so you're relying on either scavenging, but with no cavalry, so that's probably not going to be very successful, or the supplies of local, somewhat friendly tribes. That's a pretty scary situation to be in, and a very risky situation to be in. I mean, we know that Caesar makes it past this point, of course, but this could all go horrifically wrong at this point. Scouts, very little food, and were surrounded by locals who only a few days earlier had tried to kill them. Yeah. The first order of business was to repair the ships. Caesar scoured his legions for anybody with experience as a woodworker or a craftsman, <laughs> and immediately set them to work patching up the ships. The second order of business was supplies. The craftsmen needed wood. I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, he went for craftsmen and woodworkers. It shows you that, you know, there just was not much of a culture of shipbuilding among the Romans. He couldn't say, all right, any shipbuilders come forth? Because I imagine there probably weren't that many, uh, you know. I would assume that he was just using, you know, woodworkers and craftsmen who had maybe never worked with ships in their life, but just had, uh, you know, some expertise, um, you know, with wood and crafting. Uh, so the Romans just really are not prepared for this kind of thing. And everybody else needed food. Foraging was possible, but without any cavalry, their range was severely limited. Yeah. Each day, Caesar would send half of his men to fan out over the countryside and gather whatever supplies they could find. This was fine for a while, but with each passing day, they were forced to go further and further afield. Dangerous. It didn't take long for the locals to realize that the Romans were stuck. This dramatically changed the dynamic. In the dead of the night, the British diplomats and hostages slipped out of a Roman camp. <laughs> Uh-oh. The next day, while everyone was all spread out searching for supplies, a group was suddenly attacked by British chariots and cavalry. And I can imagine that the scavenging parties were probably already on edge. You know, they showed up, uh, had to do a contested landing, you know, were attacked by the Britons. Now they're low on food, they're scavenging. Uh, this is essential to feed the army, and I I'm sure if you're one of those guys, you were probably terrified of exactly this, being attacked at any moment by hostile enemies who know the territory, who could be hiding in the woods, you don't know. Um, so yeah, that that's got to be a pretty terrifying position to be in. Some people ran back to the camp and told Caesar what was happening. Mm. When he heard that his men were under attack, Caesar immediately ordered everyone back to camp and told them to prepare for battle. He then grabbed two cohorts, around 1,000 men, and personally led them out of the camp. Okay. The men under attack were barely holding their own, but when Caesar and his cohorts came into view, the British cavalry and chariots turned and fled. Mm. Caesar didn't have any way of chasing them down, but in retaliation, he marched to the nearest village and burned it to the ground. It was becoming clear that the native Britons were becoming openly hostile, so mm. Caesar kept everybody close for the next couple of days, while the craftsmen continued to repair the ships. Eventually, the Britons showed up again, this time with a large army. They had been spending their time forming a tribal coalition for the ah. purpose of kicking the Romans off the island. Caesar had around... So... Presumably, the Britons have heard, uh, at least to some extent, what has happened in Gaul. You know, the Romans showed up, and in a pretty short amount of time, they started dominating the whole region, uh, as the Gallic tribes have failed to resist them. Um, uh, I mean, given these actions, it, it seems like they've heard of what happened in Gaul, and so they are trying to prevent exactly that from happening, because... Now we're in a pretty similar situation. The Romans are showing up in this uncharted territory, um, 
and they're Romans, so they you know they want to conquer, make allies, subjugate tribes. You know that's what they do. Eight thousand infantry under his command, so his options were pretty limited. He deployed his men in a standard line in front of the camp and waited for the Britons to attack. The chariots zipped back and forth and threw their javelins. Mm. Then the cavalry charged. The Roman infantry held their ground. Nice. After that, in Caesar's words, the enemy was unable to sustain the attack. They obviously weren't used to fighting heavy infantry. Right. The Britons... Yes, yeah, so if that is what happened, because we're getting this from Caesar, but if that is what happened, you know, we have to keep in mind that the Romans may struggle facing against cavalry in these chariots, but the Britons are also probably not prepared to fight these heavily armored, tough, disciplined Roman infantry. You know, going up straight against them, the Romans would likely have an upper hand. Turned and fell back. The Romans, in a surprise move, surged forward and pursued them as fast as they could. Okay. The British cavalry and chariots were too fast to catch, but everybody on foot was killed on the spot. Wow. The Romans were now pretty fired up and spread out all over the countryside, <laughs> where they killed any civilians they could find and burned their villages to the ground. Of course. Typical. The next day, the Britons sent diplomats again acting hmm. all nice, talking peace. This looked awfully familiar. Even if Caesar didn't trust them, he was still in a precarious position, so he accepted their peace offer at face value. He also demanded from them twice as many hostages, which they agreed to. Around this time, the weather improved. His transport ships were frankly not quite prepared, but close enough. Under the cover of darkness, he loaded everybody onto the leaky, busted-up ships and pushed off around midnight wow. in a deserted camp for the Britons to find the next day. Wow, so they... There was... Okay, interesting. There was no attempt at anything further. Caesar saw his opportunity to leave, and he left. I mean, frankly, that's probably the right decision uh, with all of the danger he was in. I'm just, you know, kind of surprised that Caesar was able to see that. You know, we've seen how ambitious he is. Um, you know, I think sometimes that can cloud his perspective. He wants to, you know, do more, go further. But clearly here he recognized the uh, the risky situation he was in and just wanted to remove himself from it. So uh, but, but that's interesting. The first Roman expedition to the island of Britain was officially over. If you ask me, it was an unmitigated failure. And A agreed. they were lucky to escape with their lives. Agreed. First of all, they must have been disappointed by the level of poverty on the island. Mm. There were no secret riches, no gold, no pearls, nothing. Second, whatever Caesar's ambitions were for the island, I'm sure they weren't unify the opposition, <laughs> barely survive two battles with them, and leave in the middle of the <laughs> night with your tail between your legs. Yeah. But these were fixable problems. If he had more ships, he could pack them full of cavalry. And if he made the crossing in the spring, he could avoid the late summer storms. Caesar resolved to return next year. During the nighttime escape from Britain, some transports were blown off course, again. Oh, One no. ship, carrying 300 soldiers, was blown deep into Belgae territory. When news spread that a battered, isolated group of Romans had washed up on shore... I mean, to be fair, that's pretty bad, but... I thought they were going to be blown back to Britain, in which case they would be just dead completely. No chance. 6,000 Belgae. This is still very dangerous, though. Don't get me wrong. Descended on their position. The 300 Romans grabbed weapons, got into a tight group, and held their ground as Jeez. the Belgae completely surrounded them. The Belgae told the Romans to lay down their arms, but the Romans refused. There was a tense standoff hmm. for several hours. The Belgae occasionally closed in and tried to take the Romans by force, but they were fended off every time. Late in the day, Roman cavalry showed up out of nowhere. Caesar had got word that some of his men were trapped in Belgae territory and had ordered every rider at his disposal to ride all day to come to their rescue. Now I will say, regardless of what you think about Caesar, he was clearly looking out for his men. You know, we, we've seen... Uh, a couple of examples of that in this episode. 
Um, and you can see why he earned the loyalty of his men, both through his impressive conquest, the loot that they acquired, and through his loyalty to them. You know, they were loyal to him, but he was loyal to them. He would try and protect them the best he could. He would attempt to save them if put in a situation like this. So, I mean, you can see why that mutual loyalty and respect uh, developed so quickly, uh, and the loyalty became so strong. We're starting to see why Caesar's men would later become fanatically loyal. Yep, there we go. Uh, everything I say, Historia Civilis says five seconds later, but yep, that's uh, exactly what I just said. The 6,000 Belgae turned and ran, and the Roman cavalry pursued them. Many Belgae were killed, but more importantly, all 300 Romans escaped with wow. only a few minor wounds. Impressive. Caesar's right-hand man, Labinus, was becoming quite familiar with the Belgae, so Caesar sent him at the head of a legion to punish them for this transgression. This is the third year in a row that Caesar had been forced to fight the Belgae. Mm. He didn't want to have to fight them again next year, so he had his legions winter with Labinus in Belgae territory to keep an eye on them. Caesar returned to Cisalpine Gaul and despite his lackluster results in Britain, he sent an account of the expedition back to Rome. Mm -hmm. The response was rapturous. Britain was still a magical place in the mind of the public, and they gobbled up every little detail. Bowing to public pressure, the Senate voted for 20 days of celebration <laughs> in Caesar's honor. Even with all of his setbacks, Caesar's PR campaign was a resounding success. Yep. Okay. That was an interesting one. Um, and I, I know we have more Caesar in Britain coming. I'm excited to see that. And right at the end there, Historia Civilis touches on a very important point. And this has been true of a lot of famous men throughout history. Um, Napoleon, for example. Caesar was a great general. He's a very talented man. But he was also a very skilled uh, marketer. You know, he was great at PR. He could really market his victories to the people, and he could spin his failures to make them seem like victories. Like I said, Napoleon did exactly the same thing. Another brilliant military mind who was also a genius at marketing himself. Um, so, you know, you can see this situation in Britain, like Historia Civilis argued, was, in mine and his opinion, quite a failure. It did not go very well, but just the fact that Caesar had crossed the Rhine first off and then made it to Britain and saw some of the island, obviously he can twist that and make it sound very impressive to the people back home. And that's what he was so good at doing, and this is why he was such a successful politician. You know, it, it uh, takes more than just being a successful general to be a successful leader and politician, and we can see that with men like Caesar and Napoleon. Um, anyway, that was a, a great video. If you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope all you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.